Chapter One of A Man Obsessed by Alan E. Norse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. Chapter One Geoffrey Meyer sat back in his chair and waited. He could hardly breathe in the stifling air of the place. His hand clenched his glass until the knuckles were white, and his lips curled slightly as he watched the crowd around him. His whole body was tense. His legs, knotted tightly under the seat, were ready to move in an instant, and his eyes roved from the front to the back of the place. They were pale gray eyes that were never still, moving, watching, waiting. He had waited for so long, waited and hunted with bitter patience. But now he knew the long wait was drawing to a close. He knew that Conroe was coming and the trap was set. For the thousandth time that evening a shiver of chilly pleasure passed through him at the thought. He squirmed in eagerness, hardly daring to breathe. With his free hand he caressed the cool plastic handle of the gun that was close to his side and a tight smile appeared on his thin lips. Conroe was coming. At last, at last, and tonight he would kill Conroe. The place was a madhouse around him. In the front of the room, by the street door, was a long horseshoe bar. It was already crowded by the early revelers. A screechy in the corner blatted out the tinny, nervous music that had recently become so popular and a loud, hysterical burst of feminine laughter echoed to the back of the room. Jeff Meyer rubbed his eyes, smarting from the bluish haze filling the long, low-ceilinged room. The unhealthy laughter broke out again, and someone burst into a bellow of song, half giggle, half noise. At the adjoining table an alky psyche stirred, muttered something unintelligible, and returned his nose sadly to his glass. Jeff's eyes flicked over the man with distaste. The scrawny neck, the sagging jaw, the idiotic, almost unearthly expression of intent listening on the vapid face. A typical picture of the type. Jeff watched him for a moment in disgust, then moved his eyes on, still watching as a flicker of apprehension passed through his mind. A girl, quite naked except for the tray slung at her waist, strolled by his table wagging her hips and turning on her heaviest personality smile. "'Drive a nail, mister?' "'Beat it.' The smile cooled slightly on the girl's lips. "'Just askin,' she whined. "'You don't have to get—' "'Beat it!' Jeff shot her a venomous look, trying frantically to keep his attention from straying from the front of the room. "'It would be too much to slip up now more than he could stand to make a mistake like the last time. The trap was perfect. It couldn't fail this time. Every step of the way had been carefully sketched, plotted through long sleepless nights of conference and planning. They couldn't have hunted a man like Conroe all these years without learning something about him, about his personality, about the things he liked and disliked, the things he did, the places he frequented the friends he made. Last time, after Jeff's own blundering error had allowed him to slip through the net at the last frantic minute, there seemed to be no hope. Everything seemed all the more hopeless when the man had disappeared as completely as if he were dead. But then they had found the girl, the key to his hiding place. She had formed the top link in the long, meticulous chain which had been drawn tighter each day drawing Paul Conroe at last closer and closer to the hands of the man who was going to kill him. And now the trap was set. There could be no slip this time. There might never be another chance. The street door opened sharply, and a short, bull-necked man with sandy hair walked in. He was followed by two other men in neat business suits. The first man stepped quickly to the bar, shouldering his way through the crowd, and stood sipping beer for several minutes. He glanced closely at the people around the bar and the surrounding tables, 
before he walked toward the back and seated himself next to Meyer. Looking at Jeff with an indefinable expression, he finished his beer at a gulp and set the glass down on the table-top with a snap. "'What's up?' Jeff said hoarsely. "'Something's funny.' The sandy-haired man's voice was a smooth bass, and a frown appeared on his pink forehead. "'He should have been here by now. He left the hotel over in Camden Town an hour ago, private three-wheeler, and he headed for here.' Jeff leaned forward, his face going white. "'You've got somebody on him?' "'Yes, yes, of course.' The man's voice was sharp, and there were tired lines around his eyes. "'Take it easy, Jeff. You wouldn't be able to get him if he did come in, the way you are. He'd spot you in two seconds.' Jeff's hand trembled as he gripped his glass, and he settled tensely back in his chair. "'It can't go wrong, Ted. It's got to come off.' "'It should. The girl is here, and she got word from him last night.' Can she be trusted?" The sandy-haired man shrugged. "'Don't be silly. In this game nobody can be trusted. If she's scared enough, she'll play along, okay? We've done our best to scare her. We've scared the hell out of her. Maybe she's more scared of Conroe, I don't know. But it looks cold to me, on a platter. So get a grip on yourself." "'It's got to come off.' Jeff growled the word savagely and drained his glass at a gulp. The sandy-haired man blinked, his pale little eyes curious. He leaned back thoughtfully. "'Suppose it doesn't, Jeff. Suppose something goes wrong. Then what?' Jeff's heavy hand caught the man's wrist in a grip that was like a vice. "'You don't talk like that,' he grated. "'Your men I don't mind, but not you, understand?' It can't go wrong. That's all there is to it. No ifs, no maybes. You got that now?" Ted rubbed his wrist, his face red. "'All right,' he muttered. "'So it can't go wrong. So I shouldn't talk, I shouldn't ask questions. But if it does go wrong, you're going to be dead. Do you know that? Because you're killing yourself with this—' He sighed, staring at Meyer. What's it worth, Jeff, this constant tearing yourself apart? You've been obsessed with it for years. I know, I've been working with you and watching you for the last five of them, five long years of hunting. And for what? To get a man and kill him? That's all. What's it worth?" Jeff took a deep breath and took a pack of cigarettes from his jacket. "'Drive a nail,' he said, offering the pack. "'And don't worry about me. Worry about Conroe. He's the one who'll be dead." Ted shrugged and took the smoke. "'Okay, but if this blows up, I'm through, because this is all I can take. Nothing will blow up. I'll get him. If I don't get him now, I'll get him the next time, or the next, or the next. With or without you, I'll get him.' Jeff took a trembling breath, his gray eyes cold under heavy black brows but there hadn't better be any next time." He sat back in his chair, his face falling into the line so familiar to Ted Barr. Jeff Meyer had been a handsome man before the long years of hate had done their work on his face. He was a huge, powerfully built man, heavy-shouldered, with a strong neck and straight nose, and a shock of jet-black hair neatly clipped. Only his face showed the bitterness of the past five years years filled with anger and hatred, and a growing savagery which had driven the man almost to the breaking point. The lines about the eyes and mouth were cruel, heavy lines that had been carved deeply and indelibly into the strong face, giving it a harsh, almost brutal cast in the dim light of the bistro. He breathed regularly and slowly as he sat but his pale eyes were ice-hard as they moved slowly across the little show-floor. They took in every face, every movement in the growing throng. He was out of place, and he knew it. He had no use for the giddy, half-hysterical people who crowded these smoke-filled holes night after night. They came in droves from the heart of the city, 
to drink the watery gin and puff frantically on the contraband cigarettes as they tried desperately to drive off the steam and pressure of their daily lives. Meyer hated the smell and stuffiness of the place. He hated the loud screams of laughter, the idiotic giggles. He hated the blubbering alky psyches who crowded the bars with their whiskey and their strange, unearthly dream worlds. Above all, he hated the horrible, resounding artificiality, the brassiness and clanging noise of the crowd. His skin crawled. He knew that he couldn't possibly disappear into such a crowd, that he was as obvious sitting here as if he had been painted with red polka-dots. And he knew that if Conroe spotted him a second before he spotted Conroe, he eased back in the chair and fought for control of his trembling hands. The lights dimmed suddenly, and a huge red spotlight caught the curtain at the back of the show floor. Jeff heard Barr catch his breath for a moment, then let out a small, uneasy sigh. The crowd hushed as the girl parted the curtains and stepped out onto the middle of the floor to a fanfare of tinny music. Jeff's eyes widened as they followed her to the center of the red light. "'That's her.' Jeff glanced sharply at Barr. "'The girl? She's the one?' Barr nodded. "'Conroe knows how to pick them. He's supposed to meet her later. This is her first show for the evening. Then she has another at ten and another at two. He's supposed to take her home." He glanced around the room carefully. "'Watch yourself,' he muttered, and silently slipped away from the table. The girl was nervous. Jeff sat close enough to see the fear in her face as she whirled around the floor. The music had shifted into a slow, throbbing undertone as she started to dance. She moved slowly, circling the floor. Her hair was long and black, flowing around her shoulders, and her body moved with carefully calculated grace to the music. But there was fear in her face as she whirled, and her eyes sought the faces on the fringe of the circle. The music quickened imperceptibly, and Jeff felt a chill run up his spine. The upper part of the shimmering gown slipped from the girl's shoulders, and slowly the tempo of the dance began to change from the stately rhythm it had a moment before. The throb of the music became hypnotic, moving faster and faster. Jeff's hands trembled as he tried to draw his eyes away from the undulating figure. There had been nothing to mark the change, but suddenly the dance had become obscene as the music rose so viciously obscene that Jeff nearly gagged. He felt the tension in the crowd around him. He heard their breathing rise, felt the desperate eagerness in their hard, bright eyes as they watched. The nervousness had left the girl's face. She had forgotten her fear, and a little smile appeared on her face as her body moved in abandon to the quickening beat. Slowly she moved toward the tables, and the spotlight followed her playing tricks with her hair and gown, concealing and revealing, twisting and swaying. Jeff felt his body freeze. He fought to move, fought to take his eyes from the writhing figure as she drew closer and closer. And then she was among the people, moving from table to table, never slowing her motion, graceful as a cat, twisting and twirling in the flickering red light. In and out she moved, until she reached Jeff's table, her face inscrutable, a peacefully smiling mask. With amazing grace she leaped up on the tabletop and gave Jeff's glass a kick that sent it spinning onto the floor with a crash, and then the red light hit him full in the face. "'Get out of the light!' Like a cat he threw his chair back and struck the girl, knocking her from the table. Someone screamed and the light swung to the girl, then back to him. The table went over. He rolled out of the light, twisting and fighting through the stunned and screaming crowd. His gun was in his hand, and he frantically searched the shouting room with his eyes. "'Get him! There he goes!' He heard Barr's voice roar from the side of the room. Jeff swung sharply to the sound of the voice. He saw the tall, slender figure crouched with his back to the bar his eyes wide with fear and desperation. There was no mistaking the face, the hollow cheeks and the high forehead, 
the graying hair. It was the face he had seen in his dreams, the twisted lips, the evil, ghoulish face of the man he had hunted to the ends of the earth. For a fraction of a second he saw Paul Conroe crouched at bay, and then the figure was gone, twisting through the crowd toward the door. "'Stop him!' Jeff swung savagely into the crowd, screaming at Barr across the room. "'He's heading for the street! Get him!' The gun kicked sharply against his hand as he fired at the moving head. Rising for an instant, it disappeared again into the sea of heads. A scream rose at the shot. Women dropped to the floor, glasses crashed, tables went over. Someone clawed ineffectually for Jeff's leg. Then, abruptly, the lights went out and there was another scream. "'The door! The door! Don't let him get out!' Jeff plunged to the side of the room, wrenched open the emergency exit and plunged down the dark, narrow walkway to the street. He heard shots as he ran. Turning the corner of the building, he saw the tall figure running pell-mell down the wet street. "'There he goes! Get him!' Ted Barr hung from the door. He gasped as he held his side, his face twisted in pain. "'He hit me,' he panted. "'He's broken away.' A jet car slid from the curb and whined down the street toward the fleeing figure. "'He can't make it. I've got men on every corner in cars. They'll get him, drive him back.' "'But where's he going?' A sob of rage choked Jeff's voice. She sold us out, the bitch. She fingered me when she saw him come in. His whole body trembled and the words tumbled out, almost incoherent. But he must know the streets are blocked. Where's he running? You think I'm a mind-reader? I don't know. There are no open buildings in the whole block but this place and the Hoffman Center. He can't go anywhere else and he can't get out of the block. We've got every escapeway sewed up tight. He'll have to come back here or be shot down out there." They watched the gloomy street, tears of rage in Jeff's eyes. His hands shook uncontrollably and his shoulders sagged in exhaustion and defeat. The tavern door had burst open and people were crowding out. Jeff and Ted Barr moved back into the shadows of the alleyway and waited and listened. "'There's got to be a shot!' Jeff burst out. He couldn't have slipped through. He turned to Barr frantically. Could he have gone into the center? On what pretense? They'd throw him to the Mercy Men, or the Booby Hatch, one or the other. He'd know better than to try. The sandy-haired man sank down on his haunches and gripped his side tightly. He'll be back, or we'll hear the shooting. He couldn't have slipped through. A three-wheeled jet car slid into the curb, and a man came up to them, eyes wide. "'Get him?' Barr scowled. "'No sign. How about the other boys?' The man blinked. "'Not a whisper. He never reached the end of the block. Did you check with Kled and Barker? They haven't seen a soul down here.' Barr glanced at Jeff sharply. "'How about the streets behind?' Any chance of a breakthrough there?" The man's voice was matter-of-fact. It's airtight. He couldn't get through without somebody seeing him. He stepped back to the car and spoke rapidly into the talker for a moment or two. Nothing yet. Damn! How about Howie and the boys inside the place? Nothing from them, either. Jeff's face darkened. The Hoffman Center, he said slowly. He got into the center somehow. He must have. He'd have to have gilt-edged medical credentials to get in after hours. They don't mess around over there. And what would it gain him? Jeff peered at Barr in the darkness. Maybe he wanted to be thrown to the Mercy Men. Maybe he's figured that as a last resort. He'll go in and volunteer, make a stab at the big cash. Barr stared at the big man in horror. Look, Conroe may be desperate, but he hasn't lost his mind. My God, man, he isn't crazy. But he's scared. Of course he's scared, but how scared? Barr shrugged angrily. He'd have to be in his last legs to take a gamble like that. But they take him. 
They wouldn't ask any questions. They'd swallow him up. They'd hide him, whether they knew it or not." Jeff's voice rose in excitement. "'Look, we've hunted him down for years. We've never rested, we never quit. He knows that, and he knows why. He knows me. He knows I'm not going to quit until I get him. And he knows I will get him, sooner or later. I'm cutting too close. I'm undermining his friends. I'm always moving closer. Everywhere he goes, everything he does, I'm on to him. And he knows when I do get him, he's going to die. What does that add up to?" Barr blinked in silence. Jeff's face hardened. "'Well, I'll tell you what it adds up to. A man can take just so much. He can slide and twist and hide and keep moving just so long. Then he finds there aren't any more hiding places. But there's one last place a man can go to hide, if he's really at the end of his tether, and that's the mercy men, because there he could vanish as though he never existed." Ted Barr carefully lit a smoke. "'If that's where he went, we're through, Jeff. We'll never get him. We don't even need to worry about trying, because if he's gone there, he'll never come out again." "'Some of them do. Barr grunted. One in a million, maybe. The odds are so heavy that there's no sense thinking about it. If Paul Conroe has gone to the Mercy Men, then he's dead, and that is that." Jeff returned his weapon to his pocket sharply and walked out to the car at the curb. "'Keep your men where they are,' he said to Barr. "'Keep them there for the rest of the night. If he's found a loophole, I want to know it. If he's hidden in the buildings, he'll have to come out some time. Get some men to search the roofs, and you and I can start on the alleyways. If he's out there, we'll get him." He straightened his shoulders, and the sullen fire was back in his eyes, an angry, bitter fire. And if he's gone into the center, we'll still get him. Barr's eyes were wide. He'll never come out if he's gone where you think, Jeff. We could wait weeks or months, even years, and we still wouldn't know. Even if he did come out, we might never recognize him." "'I'll recognize him,' Jeff snarled, looking down into Barr's face. "'I'm going to kill him. I'm going to know that he's dead, because I'll see him die. And I'll kill him if I have to follow him into the center to do it.'" End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of A Man Obsessed by Alan E. Norse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two The news report blatted in Jeff Meyer's ear from the little car radio. The words came through, but he hardly heard them as his eyes watched the huge glass doors of the administration building of the Hoffman Medical Center. No word has yet been received but it is believed that the Eurasian governments may be in session several hours more in an attempt to stem the inflation. On the home front, the stock market nosedive which resulted from the new Senate taxation bill yesterday leveled off when the Secretary of Corporative Business announced this morning that the government would abandon attempts to enforce the new law, at least for the time being. Secretary Barnes stated that further study of the bill would be undertaken when more pressing governmental problems had been cleared. Jeff snapped off the switch with a snarl. The street passing the center was crowded. Lines of cars moved into and out of the traffic stream from the huge center parking tiers. The building rose high, tier upon tier. Its walls gleamed white in the bright morning sunlight, reflecting brilliant facets of golden light from thousands of polished windows. It was an immense building, sprawling across six perfectly landscaped city blocks, tall trees and cool green terraces setting off the glistening beauty of the architecture. The structure sent tower after tower up from the dingy street below, and at the foot of the towers was a buzz of furious activity. Supply trucks, carrying food and supplies for the twenty-two thousand beds and the people in them and for the additional thirteen thousand people who worked day and night to keep the huge hospital running, 
moved toward the unloading platforms. The Hoffman Medical Center was an age-old dream which had finally come true. Even those who had conceived it had not realized the tremendous need it would fulfill. From its very inception, no expense had been spared. The finest architects had thrown up the shimmering ward towers, turned toward the sun to bring light to the sick and injured who rested and healed within. Equipment unequaled anywhere in the world had filled the center's dressing and surgical rooms. The doctors, nurses, researchers, and technicians who staffed the institution had been gathered from the world over, and all the world had conceded the Hoffman Center its place as leader in the realm of medicine, ever since the cornerstone had been laid that rainy morning in the spring of the year 2085. Twenty-four years had passed since that day, and in those years the Hoffman Center had never once faltered in its leadership. The men in the car sat in stony silence. Finally, Jeff Meyer stirred, extended his hand briefly to Dead Bar. You'll cover things out here? Don't worry about it. Barr shook the hand. We'll wait to hear from you. He watched, almost wistfully, as the huge man cut through the traffic and headed for the large glass doors. Then, with a sigh, he stepped on the starter button and snaked the little jet car into the stream of traffic moving toward the city. Jeff Meyer stopped in the great, bustling lobby and stared about him almost in awe. He had never been inside the Hoffman Center before, though he had heard of it many times and in many places. Since it had taken over the service of the huge metropolis of Boston, New Haven, New York, Philadelphia, the newspapers and TV have been full of stories of the life-saving and healing that had gone on within its walls. The disease research, conducted by specialists in all phases of medicine, who were for the first time gathered together under one agency, had startled the world again and again. But there had been other stories, too not from the papers and TV, not these stories. These tales had come by word of mouth. A short sentence or two, a nervous laugh, a sneering joke, a rumor, a whispered story from a wide-eyed alky hanging over a bar. Not the sort of stories one really believed, but the sort that made one wonder. Several dozen white-garbed women moved across the floor of the huge lobby and talked quietly among themselves. Jeff sniffed uneasily. There was a curiously distasteful odor in the air, an odor of almost unhealthy cleanliness and spotless preservation. The lobby was a mill of activity. The elevators and interbuilding jitneys terminated here. People moved briskly, carrying with them the familiar air of hurry and vast pressure that infected the whole world outside. Jeff watched, spotting the corridor leading to the main administrative offices. He saw the elevators constantly rising to and returning from the huge admission offices. He noted the corridor twisting off to the staff living quarters. He stood silent, his quick gray eyes cautiously probing and watching. He tried to print an indelible picture in his mind of the layout of the building, and was almost floored by the hive-like bustle of the place. There was a complexity in the curved doorways and the brightly lighted corridors. Somewhere here he could find Paul Conroe. Somewhere in this maze of buildings and passageways was the man he had hunted for. Logic told him that. They had spent the night searching every possible alternative. His muscles ached and his eyes were red from sleeplessness, but there was a hot, angry glow in his heart. He knew that this was the only place that Conroe could have gone. Yet the place where he must be hiding was a place Jeff had heard of only in rumor, a place whose mention carried with it a half-knowledge of staggering wealth and almost indescribable horror. Someone tapped him on the shoulder. He turned, startled, to face a huge, burly man with a suspicious face and a gray uniform. "'You got business here, mister, or are we just sightseeing?' Jeff forced a grin. I don't know where to go," he said truthfully. Maybe you should go back out, then. No visitors until this afternoon. No, I'm not a visitor. I'm looking for the Volunteers' Bank. 
The ad said to come to the administration offices. The guard's face softened a little. He pointed a finger toward a corridor marked Research Administration. Right over there, he said. Office is the first door to your right. The nurse will take care of you. Myers strolled toward the corridor, his mind fumbling with the rumors and bits of half-knowledge that were all that he had to work on. Stories of drunks stumbling into the emergency rooms and never coming out. Tales of quiet, swift raids on narcotics houses, of people who never reached the police stations. But how could he make the right contact here? Research administration covered a multitude of meanings. He had read the advertisements for Hoffman volunteers in all the buses, in the copters, on the roads. Newspapers and TV had carried them for years. Meyer glanced down at his unpolished shoes, rubbed a finger over his purposely unshaven chin. What would they expect a volunteer to look like? How could they detect a fraud, an interloper? He shivered as he faced the office door. It would be a gamble, a terrible chance. Because with all the other publicity, no mention had ever been made of the Mercy Men. He glanced back, found the guard still staring at him, and walked into the office. Several people sat along the wall. A small, mousy-looking man with a bald head and close-set eyes had just sat down in the chair before the desk. He waited for the prim-looking woman wearing a ridiculous little white hat to put down her pen. She didn't even glance up as Jeff took a seat, and she kept writing for several minutes before turning her attention to the little bald man. Then she looked up and gave a frosty smile at him. "'Yes, sir?' Dr. Bennett asked me to come back today, the little man said. Follow up on last week's work. Name, please. The woman took his name and punched the button on a panel before her. An instant later, a card flipped down in a slot. She checked it, made an entry, and nodded to the man. Dr. Bennett will be ready for you at eleven. You'll find magazines in the lounge. She indicated another door, and the little man disappeared through it. Another person, a middle-aged woman, moved to take the little man's place before the desk. Jeff felt restless and glanced at his watch. It was almost eleven. Must she move so slowly? Nothing seemed to hurry her. She worked from person to person, smiling, impersonal, just a trifle chilly. Finally she nodded to Jeff, and he moved to the chair. "'Name, please?' "'You don't have a card on me.' She looked up briefly. "'A new volunteer? We're happy to have you, sir. Now, if you'll give me your name, I can start the papers through.' Jeff cleared his throat, felt his pulse pounding in his forehead. "'I'm not sure just what I want to volunteer for,' he said cautiously. The woman smiled. "'We have a rather large selection to choose from.' There are the regular mice and drug runs every week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You take the drug by mouth in the morning and give blood samples at ten, two, and four. Many of our new volunteers start on that. It pays six dollars and your lunch while you're here. Or you could give blood, but the law restricts you to once every three months on that, and it only pays thirty-five dollars. Or— Jeff shook his head and leaned forward. He looked directly into her eyes. I don't think you understand," he said softly. I want money. Lots of it. Not five or ten dollars. He looked down at the desk. I've heard you have other kinds of work. The woman's eyes narrowed. There are higher paying categories of volunteer work, of course, but you must understand that they are higher paying because they involve a greater risk to the health of the volunteer. For instance, we've been running circulation studies with heart catheterizations. We pay a hundred dollars for these, but there is an appreciable risk involved. Or sternal marrow punctures for blood studies. Usually we start— I said money, said Jeff implacably. Not peanuts. Her eyes widened and she stared at him for a long moment. It was a strange, penetrating stare that took him in from his face to his feet. Her smile faded and her fingers were suddenly nervous. 
Have you any idea what you're talking about? I have. I'm talking about the Mercy Men. She stood up abruptly and disappeared into an inner office. Jeff waited, his whole body trembling. Beads of sweat broke out on his forehead, and he gave a visible start when the woman opened the door again. Come in here, please. Then he was on the right track. He tried to conceal the excitement in his eyes as he took a seat in the small room. He waited, fidgeting. The woman packed up a small telephone on the desk and punched several buttons in rapid succession. The silence was almost intolerable as he waited, a silence that was alive and vibrant. Finally a signal light flickered and she took up the receiver. "'Dr. Schlemmel, this is the volunteer office, doctor.' She shot Jeff a swift glance. "'There's another man here to see you.' Meyer felt his heart pound. He shifted in his chair and started to take out a cigarette. Then he checked himself. "'That's right,' the woman was saying, eyeing him as if he were a biological specimen. "'I'm sorry, he hasn't given a name. Ten minutes? All right, doctor. I'll have him wait.' With that she replaced the receiver and left the room without a word. Jeff stood up, stretched his legs, and looked about the room. It was small with just a desk and two or three chairs. Obviously it served as a conference room of some sort. One wall held the panel of file buttons, another held the telephone and visiphone viewer. Over the visiphone screen a large lighted panel announced the date in sharp black letters, 32 April 2109. Below it the little transistor clock had just changed to read 11.23 a.m., almost noon and every passing minute his quarry drew farther and farther away. He glanced out the window at the rising tiers of buildings. Across the courtyard the first of the ward towers rose. To one side of it were a series of long, low structures with skylights. These were the kitchens, perhaps, or maintenance buildings. There were dozens of them, any one of which could be hiding Paul Conroe. Jeff clenched his hands until the nails bit his palms. He stared down at the buildings. Conroe could be anywhere down there. Another man had already seen Dr. Schlimmel. A door clicked behind him and he turned sharply. A man entered the room and closed the door behind him. Smiling, he walked over to the desk. Meyer nodded and watched the man. He felt a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. For the briefest instant the doctor had caught his eye and Jeff felt everything that he had planned to say crumble like dust around him. The man hardly looked like a doctor, although his white jacket was immaculate and a stethoscope peeped from his side pocket. He was tall and slender, almost fifty years old, with round, cheerful pink cheeks and a little pug nose that seemed completely out of place on his face. A harmless-looking man, Jeff thought, except for his eyes but his eyes. They were the sharpest, most penetrating eyes Jeff had ever seen. And they were watching him. Quite independent of the smiling face, they watched his every move, studying him. The eyes were full of wisdom, but they were also tinged with caution. The doctor sat down and motioned Jeff to the seat facing the desk. He pushed a cigar case across the desk to him. Jeff hesitated, then took one. I thought these were slightly illegal," he said. The doctor grinned. Slightly. Thanks to us, as you probably know, we did most of the work here on tobacco smoke and cancer. Actually, got legislation pushed through on it. He leaned back easily in his chair as he lit his own cigar. Still, one once in a while won't do too much harm. And there's nothing like a good smoke to get things talked out. I'm Roger Schlemmel, by the way. I didn't get your name." "'Meyer,' said Jeff. "'Jeffrey Meyer.' The doctor's eyes narrowed quizzically. "'I hope my girl didn't bother you too much. She channels most of the volunteer work here, as you see. Then, occasionally, cases come in which she'd rather turn over to me.' He paused for a moment. "'Cases like yours, for instance.' Jeff blinked, his mind racing. 
It would take acting, he thought, real acting to fool this man. The face was deceptively young and benign, almost complacent. But the eyes were far from young. They were old, old eyes. They had seen more than I should see. They missed nothing. To fool a man with eyes like that... Jeff took a deep breath and said, I want to join the Mercy Men. Dr. Schlemmel's eyes widened very slightly. For a long moment he said nothing, just stared at the huge man before him. Then he said, That's interesting. It's also very curious. The name, I mean. Oh, I can understand the attraction such an idea might have for people, but the name that's become so popular, it baffles me. Mercy, men. It gives you a curious feeling, don't you think? Brings up mental pictures of handsome young interns fighting the forces of evil and death, the brave heroes giving their all for the upward flight of humanity, all that garbage, you know. The eyes hardened quite suddenly. Where did you hear of the Mercy Men, I wonder? Jeff shrugged. The word's been around for quite a while. A snatch here, a story there, even though it isn't advertised too openly. Dr. Schlemmel looked him straight in the eye. And suppose I told you that there is no such organization, either here or anywhere else on earth that I know of. A tight smile appeared on Jeff's face. I'd call you a Class A liar. Schlemmel's eyebrows went up. I see. That's a big word. Maybe you can support it. I can. There are mercy men here. There have been for several years. You're sure of that? Quite. I know one. He was a skid rower with a taste for morphine when I first ran into him, a champagne appetite to go with a beer income. Then he went out of circulation for about six months. Now he has a place up in the Catskills, with many, many thousands of dollars in the bank. Of course, he uses the money to feed several hundred cats in his basement. Jeff's eyes narrowed. He never liked cats very much before he left here. There are other funny things he does. Nothing serious, of course, but peculiar. Still, he doesn't need the dope any more. Schlemmel smiled and put his fingers together. That would be Luke Tandy. Yes, Luke was a little different when he left, but the work was satisfactory and we paid off. Yes, said Jeff softly. One hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Cash on the line. To him or his heirs. He was lucky. So, what are you doing here? I want a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, too. The doctor's eyes met Jeff's squarely. And you are a liar, too. Jeff reddened. What do you mean? Look, let's get this straight right now. Don't lie to me. I'll catch you every time." The doctor's eyes were hard. I see a man who's eaten well for a long time, wearing dirty but expensive clothes, who doesn't drink, who doesn't use drugs, who is young and strong and capable. He tells me he wants to join the Mercy Men for money. He tells me a lie. Now I'll ask you again. Why are you here?" For money for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars." The doctor sighed and leaned back. "'All right, no matter. We'll go into it later, I suppose. But I think you'd better understand certain things. It's no accident that your information on the Mercy Men is so vague. We've been careful to keep it that way, of course. The more vague the stories, the fewer curiosity-seekers and busybodies we have to contend with. Also, the more distasteful the stories, the more desperate people will become before they come to us. This we particularly desire, because the work we do here requires a very desperate man to volunteer." As he talked, the doctor brought out a pack of cards from the desk and began riffling them nervously in his fingers. Jeff's eyes caught them and a chill went down his back. They were curious cards, not their regular playing variety. These were smaller, with a peculiar marking system in bright red on the white faces. 
Jeff shivered, and he was puzzled at the chill that gripped his body. He shifted in his chair in growing tension and tried to take his eyes from the cards. The doctor snubbed out his cigar, leaned back in the chair, and gave the cards a riffle and regarded Jeff closely. We've done a lot here since the center opened. Work based on years of background research. A century or more ago, there were terrible medical problems to be faced. Polio was a killer then. They had no idea of cancer control. They were faced with a terrific death rate from heart disease. All those things are beaten now, a thing of the past. But as the old killers moved out, new ones took their place. Look at the half-dozen NVI plagues we've had in the past few years, neurotoxic virus infections that started to appear out of nowhere twenty years ago. Look at the alky psyches you see in every bar today, a completely new type of alcoholism psychosis that we haven't even been able to describe, much less cure. Look at the statistics on mental disease, rising in geometric progression almost every year. The tall doctor stood up and walked to the window. We don't know why it's happening, but it is. Something's on the march, something ghastly and evil among the people. Something that has to be stopped. He gave the cards a sharp riffle and tossed them onto the desk with a sigh. We can't stop it until we know something about the human brain and how it works, and why it does what it does and how. We don't even understand fully the structure of the nervous system, much less understand its function. And we've learned all we can from cats and dogs and monkeys. Any further study of a monkey's brain will give us great insight into the neuroses and complexes of monkeys, no doubt. But it won't teach us anything more about men." His voice was very soft. "'You can see where this leads, I think.' Jeff Meyer nodded slowly. "'You need men,' he said. "'We need men. Men to study. Cruel as it may sound, men to experiment upon. We can't learn any more from any other variety of experimental animal. But there are problems. Toy around with a man's brain, and he is likely to die, quite abruptly. Or he may be deranged, or he may go violently insane. Most of the work, however well planned, however certain we were of results, however safe it appeared, proved to be completely unpredictable. Much of the work and many of the results were quite horrible, but were making progress, slow, but progress nonetheless. So the work continues. It hasn't been very popular. No man in his right mind would volunteer for such a job. So we hired men. For the most truly altruistic work in the world, our workers come with the most mercenary of motives. We pay for their services, and we pay well. A hundred thousand dollars is a small fee on our scale. We have the government behind us. The sky is the limit, if we need a man for a job. The money is paid when the work is completed, either to the man himself or to his heirs. You see why the name they have given themselves is so curious. Medical mercenaries, the mercy men. That's why a man must be desperate to come to us. That's why we must be so very careful who joins us, for what motives." Jeff Meyer stared at his hands and waited in the silence of the room. His eyes strayed once again to the curious cards, and the chill of fear went through him like a ghastly breeze. This was a port of last resort, a road that could end in horror and death. Ted Barr had said it wasn't worth it, that Conroe would never escape alive, but he knew that Conroe could, and he knew Conroe well enough to know that he would. Jeff felt the old bitterness and hatred swell up in his mind, and his hands trembled as he sat. He had long since thrown aside his life as he had known it, cast off the veneer of civilized life that he had acquired, to hunt Paul Conroe down and kill him. There was nothing else in his life that mattered. It had been a long, grueling hunt, tracking him, following him, studying him, tracing his movements and habits, plotting trap after trap, driving the man to desperation. 
but there had been no indication, anywhere along the line, that Conroe would turn to such a desperate gamble as this. But he must have known that death otherwise was inevitable. Here he could be changed. He might disappear from the face of the earth in the oblivion of quiet death to be sure, but he also might emerge, unscathed, to live in wealth the rest of his life, unrecognizable and safe. Jeff Meyer looked up at the doctor, and his eyes were hard. "'I haven't changed my mind,' he said. "'What has to be done to join?' Dr. Schlimmel sighed and turned resignedly to the file panel. "'There are tests that are necessary and rules to be obeyed. You'll be confined and regimented. And once you're assigned to a job and sign a release, you're in.' He leaned forward and punched the visiphone button. Tapping his fingers idly on the desk, he waited until an image blinked and cleared on the screen. "'Blackie,' he said tiredly, "'better send the nasty Frenchman up here. We've got a new recruit.' The visiphone snapped off, and Jeff sat frozen to his seat, his pulse throbbing in his neck, every nerve in his body screaming in excitement. The face on the screen had been clearly visible for a moment a pale face with large gray eyes, a woman's face, surrounded by flowing black hair. It was a face that was impressed indelibly on his memory. It belonged to the girl who had danced the night before in the red light. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 of A Man Obsessed by Alan E. Norse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 There was no doubt of it. She was the girl in the nightclub, the dancing girl, with the flowing black hair and the mask-like smile, who had led him to Conroe and then brought the spotlight to his face to spring the trap too soon. Frantically, Jeff fought to control his excitement. He knew his face was white, and he avoided the doctor's puzzled glance. But he couldn't control the angry fire burning in his mind, the little voice screaming out, "'He's here! He's here! Somewhere!' But why was she here? The doctor had called her Blackie. He had spoken to her with familiarity. Jeff's mind whirled. He had the strangest feeling that he had missed something somewhere along the line that he knew the answer but couldn't quite grasp it. What could the girl's sudden appearance in the center involve? Or had her appearance at the nightclub been the unusual one? A buzzer rang and the office door opened to admit a small, weasel-faced man. The doctor looked up and smiled. "'Hello, Jacques. This is Jeff Meyer, the new recruit. Take him down and get him quartered in, all right? And you might brief him a little. He's awfully green." The little man scratched his long nose and regarded Jeff with a nasty smile. "'A new one, huh? Where are you going to line him up?' "'No telling. We'll see where the tests put him first. Then we'll talk about jobs.' The smile widened on the little man's face, turning down the end of his long pointed nose and revealing a dirty yellow row of teeth. His eyes ran over Jeff from head to toe. Big one, too. But then they fall just as hard as the rest. Want me to take him right down?" Schimmel nodded. Maybe he can still get lunch. His eyes shifted to Jeff. This is the nasty Frenchman, he said, motioning toward the little man with his thumb. He's been around for a long time. He can show you the ropes. And don't let him bother you too much. His sense of humor, I mean. Like I said, he's been around here a long time. You'll get quarters, and you'll be expected to stay with your group for meals and everything else. That means no contacts outside the hospital as long as you're here. You'll get the daily news reports, and there are magazines and books in the library. If you've got other business outside, you haven't any business in here. Any time you leave the center, it's considered an automatic breach of contract." He paused for a long moment and gave Jeff a strange look, almost a half-smile. "'And you'll find that questions aren't appreciated around here, Jeff. Any kind of questions. 
The men don't like people too much when they ask questions." The nasty Frenchman shuffled his feet nervously, and Jeff started out the door. Then the little man turned back to Dr. Schimmel. "'They brought Tinker back from the table about ten minutes ago. He is in pretty bad shape. Maybe you should look at him?' This was the big job today, wasn't it? Schimmel's eyes were sharp. What did Dr. Bartell say? He said no dice. It was a bust. I see. Well, it may be just the diadrax wearing off now, but I'll be down to see. The nasty Frenchman grunted and turned back to Jeff. His face still wore the nasty little grin. Let's go, big boy, he said, and started down the hall. Jeff watched the corridors as they passed, counting them one by one, trying desperately to keep himself oriented. He glanced at his watch and angrily sucked in his breath. Minutes were slipping by, precious minutes, minutes that could mean success or failure. A thousand questions crowded his mind, and behind them all was the girl. She was the key, he was sure of it. She would know where Conroe was, where he could be found. They reached an elevator, stepped aboard and shot down at such dizzying speed that Jeff nearly choked. Then suddenly they came to a jolting stop and stepped into a dingy, gray corridor that was dimly lit by bare bulbs in the ceiling. The nasty Frenchman punched a button in the wall and turned to regard Jeff. The sneering little smile was still on his lips as the far-off rumble of a jitney grew to a sharp clatter. The little car dropped down from its ceiling track. The little man hopped in nimbly and motioned Jeff in beside him. Then the car took off for the ceiling again, swinging crazily and speeding down the maze of corridors and curves. Jeff stirred uneasily, growing more and more confused with every turn. Look, he broke out finally, where's this thing taking us? The nasty Frenchman turned pale eyes toward him. You worried or something? Well, it looks like we're headed for the center of the earth. I'd like to be able to find my way out sometime." Why? The question was so blunt that it left Jeff's jaw sagging for a moment. Well, I'm not planning to spend the rest of my life in here. The nasty Frenchman guffawed. It was not a pleasant laugh. Here for a nice restful vacation, huh? You wise guys are all the same. Go ahead, dream. I won't bother you." The little man turned his attention to the controls and the car swung sharply to the right and headed down another corridor. Jeff scowled as he watched the lighted corridors flash by. Were they speeding so far, so deep in the depths of the building? Or was this part of a definite plan to confuse, to lose recruits in the mammoth place so completely that they could never find their way out? Jeff shrugged finally. It really didn't matter too much. He had one job and only one. He could worry about escape when it had been accomplished. That girl, he said finally. The doctor called her Blackie. Is she down here where we are going? How should I know? I don't keep her on a leash. The little man's face darkened and his eyes turned suspiciously to Jeff. I mean, is she one of the group? One of the mercy men? The nasty Frenchman threw a switch sharply, swerving the speeding car through a long, dim passage. He ignored the question, as if he hadn't heard it. In the dim light his skin was pasty yellow and wrinkled like a mummy. The cruelty and avarice on his face was frightening. Jeff watched him for a moment or two, then said, "'What brought you here? To the mercy men, I mean.' The nasty Frenchman's eyes flashed poisonously, his face a horrid mask. Did I ask you your racket before you came in? No. Then don't ask me mine, and you won't forget that if you're smart." He turned his attention sharply to the controls, ignoring Jeff for several moments. Finally he said, "'You'll share a room and you'll eat at eight, noon and six. Tess should start tomorrow morning at eight-thirty. You'll be in your room when the doctors come for you. You won't have any status here until you're tested. Then you'll sign a release and wait for a job assignment. You won't have any choice of work. That's just for the older ones. 
Some of the work is with central nervous system, some is with sympathetic, some work concentrates on spinal cord and peripherals, but most of the interest these days is in cortical lesions and repair. That pays the best, too. Couple hundred thousand at a crack, with a fairly good risk. And what's a fairly good risk in here? The grin reappeared on the little man's face again. It was almost savage in its cruelty. Ten per cent for recovery is a good risk. That means complete recovery from the work, no secondary infection, complete recovery of faculties. In other words, complete success in the work. Then a fairly good risk runs slightly lower, more casualty, maybe five per cent recovery, and a high-risk job averages two per cent. The grin broadened. You've got a better chance of living sitting under an atom bomb, my friend. And once you sign a release, relieving the hospital and the doctors of all responsibility, you're in, and held to your contract by law. This is no vacation. But if you're lucky enough to come through— The little man's eyes were bright with eagerness. They pay off. Oh, how they pay off. If you're lucky, you'll get a good starter, maybe a hundred thousand with good risk." He scratched his nose and regarded Jeff closely. "'Of course, there are incomplete recoveries, too. They have trouble keeping them out of the news, if they ever leave. Pretty messy sometimes, too.' Jeff felt his face paling at the cruel eagerness in the little man's voice. What could bring a man to a place like this, especially this kind of a man? Or had he been a different kind of a man before he came in? How long had he been here, waiting from experiment to experiment, waiting to live or to die, waiting for the payoff, the big cash that waited at the end of a job? What could such an existence do to a man? What could there be to drive him on? Jeff shuddered, then gasped as the car gave a sudden lurch around a corner and settled to the floor. The nasty Frenchman hopped out, motioned to Jeff to follow. They started walking toward the escalator at the end of the passageway. Jeff searched each doorway they passed, keeping alert for a sign of the black-haired woman. "'Look,' he said finally. "'This girl, Blackie, I mean, who is she?' The nasty Frenchman stopped in his tracks, glared at Jeff. "'What is she? An old family friend or something? You keep asking about her.' "'I know her from somewhere.' So why bother me with your questions?" Jeff's face darkened angrily. "'I want to see her, all right? Don't get so jumpy!' The little man whirled on him like a cat. Jeff's arm was wrenched behind his back until he felt the tendons rip. With unbelievable strength the nasty Frenchman twisted the huge man back against the wall and glared up at him with blazing eyes. "'You're a smart guy coming around here asking questions,' he snarled, giving Jeff's arm a vicious wrench. "'You think you can fool me? You ask about this, you ask about that. Why so nosy? Blackie, me, everything. What are you doing here? Going after the big cash, or asking questions?' "'The cash!' Jeff gasped. He twisted to wriggle free of the iron-like grip. Then don't ask questions. We don't like nosy people here. We like people that roll dice square and mind their own business." The little man gave the arm a final agonizing wrench and released it. He jumped back, poised, eyes savagely eager. Every instinct screamed at Jeff to rush him, but he slumped against the wall. Rubbing his aching arm, he fought for control. He knew a fight now could ruin things completely. Already he had blundered terribly. He cursed under his breath. How stupid he'd been not to have realized how unpopular questions would be to people in a place like this. And surely the word would get to the girl now that he was asking about her, unless he could get to her first. Still rubbing his elbows painfully, he turned to the nasty Frenchman. "'Okay, let it go,' he growled. "'Where do we go from here?' The room was small and barren, dingy and gray. It matched Jeff's spirit perfectly. 
he entered it with the nasty Frenchman at his heels and stared at the two stark hospital beds against the far wall, the two footlockers, the two small desk and chair combinations. There was no window in the room. Indeed, there was nothing about the room or corridor to prove that they were not twenty miles underground. Certainly the jitney ride had been no reassurance to the contrary. The dim wall-lights glowed on scrubbed, peeling paint, and the floor was covered with clean but well-worn plastic matting. Against one wall was a TV set. Between the beds a door led into a compact lavatory and shower. Glancing in, Jeff saw the lavatory was also connected with the adjoining room. "'It's no grand hotel,' the nasty Frenchman said sourly. "'But it's clean, and it's a bed. This corridor quarters your whole unit, the C unit. Other units are on the other floors, up and down.' Jeff looked around the room gloomily. "'Where can I eat?' "'The mess hall's four flights down. Takes the escalator at the end of the hall. It closes in half an hour, so you'd better step on it. And if you're smart, you won't go wandering around. The boys in grey you see here and there don't like us very much." His face creased into a sardonic grin as he started for the door. "'And you'll be smart to change before you come down. The faster people stop thinking you're new here, the happier you'll be.' With that he turned and disappeared down the hall. Jeff gave a sigh and prowled the room. One of the footlockers held an amazing assortment of clean and dirty clothes. On the floor of it lay a large heap of dirty shirts and trousers, and nested squarely in the center of the pile was a heap of gold rings and wristwatches. Jeff blinked, not quite believing his eyes. He hadn't thought to ask about his roommate, but apparently he had one who had not yet made his appearance. Apparently everyone wore similar clothing. He found the other locker filled with clean shirts and dungarees. Swiftly he started to change, his mind racing. His body was sore all over and he felt a dry, hot feeling around his ears from lack of sleep. His arm ached miserably every time he moved it. If only he could sleep for a little while, but he knew there was no time to be wasted. In the mess hall, there would still be people. Somewhere among them he would find the girl. Carefully he considered the problem. The girl was the key. He had to find her, to make certain that Conroe was here. And he had to find her quickly, catch her unawares, before she had a chance to alibi or hide. Conroe would be hidden. He would never come into the open until he was sure that he had not been followed he too must be taken unawares. Jeff had seen Conroe slip out of too many traps in the past. A blunder now could be the last, and if Conroe had time to plan there would be many, many blunders. A car buzzed down the hall as he stood in the room and stopped a little way from the door. There were voices, subdued, yet carrying a sharp note of frantic excitement. Jeff paused, listening to the combination of unfamiliar sounds. A grunt, a low curse, a rustle of whispered conversation, a low whistle. Then the door to the next room banged open, and a rumble and squeak of wheels came to his ears. Geez, what a job! Yeah, looks bad. Did the doc see him? He said he'd be down. Gotta let it wear off before you can tell. This was the works this time. Jeff walked quietly to the door of the connecting lavatory, his nerves tingling. A new sound was apparent, an unearthly sound of labored, gurgling breathing. Jeff shivered. He had heard a sound like that only once before in his life, in a rocket during the Asian War, when a man had been struck in the throat with a chunk of shrapnel. Carefully he pushed the door open an inch, peered through. There were three men standing in the room, maneuvering a man, if it was a man, from the four-wheeled cart onto the bed. The man's head was covered to the shoulders with bandage. A patch of fresh blood showed near the temple, and a rubber tube emerged from where the mouth should have been. "'Got him down? Better cover him closer. Restrainers. He may jump around. Doc said three weeks for shock to wear off. 
if he makes it through the night. Yeah, and this is the big cash for Tinker, too. Harpo nearly beat him to the job, but Schimmel had promised him. Jeff shuddered. This, then, was one of the mercy men, finished with a job. The gurgling sound grew louder, measuring itself with the man's breathing. Short, shallow, a measure of death. An experiment had been completed. Jeff closed the door silently. His face in the mirror was pasty white and his hands were shaking. Here was the factor that had been plaguing him from the start, finally breaking through to the surface. The road he was traveling was a one-way road. He had to find Conroe and get off the road quickly while he could, because he dared not travel the road too far. The air in the corridor seemed fresher as Jeff started for the escalator. It was almost two o'clock and he hurried, anxious to reach the mess hall before it closed. He consciously fought the picture of the man on the bed out of his mind. With effort he focused his attention once again on the girl. At the end of the corridor he stepped onto the creaky, down-going escalator. If only he could check with Ted Barr, make certain that the trail had really ended at the Hoffman Center, make sure that Conroe was not really somewhere outside, still hiding, still running. One thing seemed certain. If Conroe were really here, he too would be faced with the testing and classification. He too would be traveling the same grim road as Jeff himself, and as a newcomer he too would be under suspicion and scrutiny. Jeff stopped short on a landing. He was suddenly aware that he had lost count of the flights he had gone down. He looked back to check his bearings, then moved around to the stairs moving up. The escalator creaked and groaned, as if every turn would be its last, and Jeff stared dreamily at the moving wall, waiting, until he passed the open well to the opposite stairs. He froze, his mind screaming. Unable to move, he stared at the pale, frightened face of the man on the down-going stairway. In the brief seconds while they passed, he stood rooted, paralyzed, unable to cry out. Then with a hoarse yell he turned. Half stumbling, half falling, he ran down the upgoing stairs until he reached the opening. Then he vaulted across the barrier, crashing his shoulder against the wall as he went through. He caught a glimpse of the tall, slender figure running from the bottom of the stairs into the corridor at the bottom, and he shouted again in a burst of blinding rage. He took the steps three at a time, his mind numb to the pain as his foot struck the solid floor and twisted sending him sprawling on his face. In an instant he was on his feet again running, frantically, blindly, to the end of the corridor. It broke into two hallways, going off in a Y. Both were dark and both were empty. Jeff stood panting, almost screaming out in rage, his whole body trembling. He started blindly down one corridor, jerked open a door, and stared in at the small, empty office. He tried another door and another. Then he turned and ran back to the Y, spun around the corner, and ran pell-mell down the second corridor. Only his own desperate footfalls echoed back to him in the darkness. Back at the Y he sank to the floor. Still panting, he sobbed aloud in his rage, clenching his fists as he tried to regain control of his spinning mind. Rage there was, yes, and hatred and bitter frustration but also, tumbling through his mind in a wild, elated cadence, was a cry of sheer, incoherent, savage joy. Because he knew now, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that Paul Conroe was among the mercy men. He looked up suddenly at the two figures approaching him from the lighted corridor. One of them held a tiny, deadly scorcher pistol trained on his chest. The other, a huge, burly man, reached down and jerked Jeff's face up into the light. "'What's your unit?' the harsh voice grated. Jeff glimpsed the gray cloth of the man's jacket, the official-looking black belt over his shoulder. "'See, unit,' he panted. The blow caught him full on the chin, twisting his head around with a jolt. "'Wise guy, wandering around without a pass,' the voice growled. "'You goddamn scabs think you run the place, don't you?' Another blow struck him behind the ear, and the fist caught him hard in the pit of the stomach. 
As he doubled over retching, a smashing blow caught his chin, and he tasted blood in his mouth as his knees buckled under him. He felt them, vaguely, half carrying, half dragging him down the corridor. He heard a door open and fell face down on the floor. A harsh voice said, "'Here's your roommate, Scut. Keep him home from now on.' And the door slammed behind him. Painfully, he raised himself on his hands, shook his head dazedly. "'You look like you're sick or something.' The voice from the bed was hard and insolent. Painfully, Jeff jerked his head up and stared. The girl blinked coldly and pulled a frazzled cigarette from her blue cotton shirt. She flicked a match with her thumb and touched off the smoke. Then she stared down at Jeff mockingly. "'Sorry, Jack,' said the girl called Blackie. "'But it looks like we're roomies. So you might as well get used to the idea.'" End of Chapter 3《Chapter Four of A Man Obsessed by Ellen E. Norse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Something exploded in Jeff's brain then, something he could no more control than the creeping, vicious hatred of Paul Conroe that had driven him for so long. The jangling, tinny music of the tavern was screaming through his mind the indelible picture of the swerving, gyrating figure, the long raven hair, the impassive face, the full lips. His knees buckled and his head was reeling, but he lurched across the room at the girl. Catching her by the collar, he drew her face up to his with a wrench that knocked the cigarette from her hand and brought her breath out in a gasp. "'All right,' he grated. "'Where is he? Come on, come on, talk. Where is he?' And don't tell me he's not here, because I know he is, understand? I just saw him. I just chased him down below. I know he's here. I want to know where." Her foot came up sharply and caught him in the leg, sending an agony of pain into his thigh. Suddenly she began to fight like a cat, clawing, biting, blue fire in her eyes. Jeff brought his hand up and slapped her face twice hard. With a snarl she caught him in the stomach with her foot and tore herself free, sending him reeling back against the wall. He bounded off, then stopped dead in his tracks. A horrible realization exploded in his mind. She was standing poised, her face twisted, her eyes burning, a stream of poisonous language pouring at him. In her hand was a knife, blade up, balanced in her hand with deadly intent. But Jeff hardly noticed the knife. He didn't hear the words as he stared unbelievably at her face, his heart sinking. Because the face was wrong somehow. The lips were not right, the nose was shaped differently, the glow in the eyes was not right. His panting turned into a bitter sob of disbelief, of incredible disappointment. There couldn't be any doubt, it simply was not the right girl. Where, where is he? he asked weakly, his heart pounding helplessly in his throat. "'Not another step,' the girl snarled. "'Another inch, and I'll slice you up like putty.' "'No, no,' Jeff shook his head, trying desperately to clear his mind, to understand. This was the girl he had seen in the visiphone screen. Yes, the same clothes, the same face. But she wasn't the girl in the tavern. "'Conroe,' he blurted out plaintively. You, you must know Conroe. I've never heard of Conroe. But you must have. Last night, in that dive, dancing. Her jaw dropped as she stared at him in disgust. Then she gave the knife a flip into the desktop and sank down on her bed, her face relaxing. Go away, she said tiredly. That goddamn Frenchman's sense of humor. Go on, beat it. I'm not rooming with any hoppy, at least until he's off the stuff." "'You don't know Conroe?' The girl looked at him closely. "'Look, Jack,' she said with patient bitterness, "'I don't know who you are, and I don't know your pal Comstock, or whatever it is, and I sure as hell wasn't dancing anywhere last night. I was working in the tank last night, getting some looped-up hophead cooled off for the axe this morning. 
and it wasn't fun for either of us, and you'll be down there yourself if you don't cool off, and you won't like it either. So go away. Don't bother me." Jeff sank down on the opposite bed, his head in his hands. You... you looked so much like her. So I looked so much like her. She spat out a filthy word and drew her legs up, glaring at him. Jeff reddened, his whole body aching. All right, I'm sorry. I got excited. I couldn't help it. And I can't leave here. I tried it a little while ago and ran into a couple of fists. Blackie's lip curled. The guards don't like us down here. They don't like anything about us. They'll kill you if you give them half an excuse. Jeff looked up at her. But why? I didn't do anything. The girl laughed harshly. Do you think that makes any difference to them? Look, Jack, let's face it. You're in a prison, understand? They don't call it that, and there aren't any bars. But you aren't going anywhere, and the boys in gray are here to see that you don't. And they hate us because we're not good enough for them, and we're in line for the kind of money they don't dare go after. You're here for one thing, to make money, big money, or to get your brains jolted loose and nothing else. She looked up at him, her eyes narrowing. Or are you? Jeff shook his head miserably. No, nothing else. I'm waiting for testing. This other thing is an old fight, that's all. You wouldn't understand. You just look so much like the girl." He looked up at her, studying her face more closely. She wasn't as young as he had thought at first. There were little wrinkles around her eyes, a shade too much makeup showing where her mouth crinkled when she talked. Her lips were painted too full, and there was a tiredness in her eyes, a beaten, hunted look that she couldn't quite hide. She leaned back on the bed, and even relaxation didn't erase the hardness. Only the jet-black hair and the smooth black eyebrows looked young and fresh. Jeff shook his head and kept staring at her. "'I don't get it,' he said helplessly. "'I was assigned to this room.' "'So was I,' the girl's eyes hardened. "'Are you one of the... workers?' she sneered bitterly. "'You mean one of the experimental animals? That's right, the mercy men. Full of mercy, that's me!" She spat on the floor. But the mixed company! There was no humor in her laugh. What did you think? They'd have a separate boudoir for the ladies? How do they treat any kind of experimental animal? Get off it, Jack! They don't care what we do or how we live. All they want is good, healthy human livestock when they're ready for it. Nothing more. That means they have to feed us and bunk us down period. And if you've got any wise ideas—' Her eyes widened with a look of open viciousness, shocking in its intensity. "'Just try something. Just once. You'll find out a lot about Blackie in a hell of a rush.' She rolled over contemptuously, turning her back to him. "'You'll find out I don't like loonies for roommates, for instance.' Jeff lit a cigarette, his hands trembling. The room seemed to be spinning, and he felt his muscles sagging in pain and fatigue. He had counted so much on information from the girl. But incredible as the resemblance was, Blackie couldn't have been the girl he had seen in the tavern. If she had recognized him, he would have spotted it. She couldn't have hidden it completely. Suddenly he felt terribly alone, almost beaten, helpless to go on. Where could he go? What could he do? How could he follow a trail that led straight into stone walls? He leaned back on the bed and yielded to the fatigue that plagued him. His mind sank into a confusion of hopelessness. Maybe, he thought wearily, maybe that plaguing doubt that lay in the fringes of his mind was right. Maybe he'd never find Conroe. He sighed as the darkness of utter exhaustion closed in on him and his head sank back to the pillow. He knew he was dreaming. Some tiny corner of his mind stood aside, prodding him, telling him he dare not sleep, that he must be up, moving, hunting, that the danger was too grave for sleep. But he slept, and the little corner of his mind prodded and cried out and watched. He was walking along a brook, a walk he had taken once before, 
so very many years ago. A cool breeze struck down from the meadow, rumpling his hair. He heard the tinkle of the water as it sparkled across a rock. And he was afraid, so desperately afraid. The voice in his mind screamed out to him at every footstep, until he faltered and slowed and stopped. "'Not here, Jeff, not here. Stop, stop now. If you go farther, you'll be dead.' Sweat broke out on his forehead. He tried to move forward, felt an iron grip on his legs. "'Stop, Jeff, stop. You'll die, Jeff.' An overpowering wave of fear swept over him, and he turned. He ran like the wind, with the voice following him, crying out in his ear, following him on ghostly wings. In the dream he became a little boy again, running, screaming in fear. A man stood in his pathway, arms outstretched, and Jeff threw himself into his father's arms, sobbing as though his heart would break, clutching at him with incredible relief, burying his face in the strong, comforting chest. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, you're safe. You're here, Daddy. He looked up at his father's smiling face, and he saw the strong, sensitive lines around the big man's mouth, the power and wisdom in the eyes. Nowhere else was there this sense of strength, of unlimited power, of complete comfort. He buried his face again in old Jacob Meyer's chest. A flood of deep peacefulness passed through his mind. Jeff, Jeff! Watch out!" He stiffened, his whole body going cold. The strong arms were no longer around him, and he was suddenly afraid again, afraid with a terror that bit deep into his mind. He looked up and screamed, a scream that echoed and re-echoed. It came again and again, a scream of pure terror. Because his father's face was no longer next to him. There was another face, hanging bodiless and luminous above him. It was chalk-white, a face of pure, ghoulish evil staring at him. It was Conroe's face. He screamed again, tried to cover his eyes, tried to shrink down into nothing. But the hideous, twisted face followed him. The horrible fear intensified, sweeping through him like a flame, twisting into fiery hate in his heart as he watched the evil, glowing face. "'He killed your father, Jeff. He butchered your father shot him down like an animal in cold blood." Jeff screamed, and the evil face grinned and moved closer, until the rank breath was hot on Jeff's neck. "'You must kill him, Jeff. He killed your father.' "'But why? Why did he do it? Why? Why? Why?' There was no answer. The voice trailed off into horrible laughter. Quite suddenly the face was gone. In its place was a tiny, distant figure, running, running like the wind, down the narrow, darkened hospital corridor. And Jeff was running, too, burning with hatred, fighting desperately to catch up with the fleeing figure to close the gap between them. The walls were of gray stone. Conroe was running swiftly, unhindered, but horrid objects swept out of the walls at Jeff. He tripped on a wet, slimy thing on the floor and fell on his face. He scrambled up again as the figure disappeared around a far corner. The walls were gray and wet around him. He reached the Y, waiting, panting, screaming out his hatred down the empty, re-echoing hallways. Then suddenly he glimpsed the figure and started running again, but they were no longer in the Hoffman Center. They were running down a hillside, a horrible, barren hillside, studded with long knives and spears and swords, shiny blades standing straight up from the ground, gleaming in the bluish light. Conroe was far ahead, moving nimbly through the gauntlet of swords. But Jeff couldn't follow his path, for new knives sprang up before him, cutting his ankles, ripping his clothes. He panted, near exhaustion, as the figure vanished in the distance. Sinking down to the ground, Jeff sobbed, his whole body shaking. And the voice screamed mockingly in his ear, "'You'll never get him, Jeff. No matter how hard you try, you'll never get him. Never, never, never. But I've got to, I've got to, I've got to find him and kill him. Daddy told me to. He woke with a jolt, his scream still echoing in the still room, sweat pouring from his forehead and body, soaking his clothes. He sat bolt upright. He searched for his watch, but couldn't find it. 
How long had he slept? His eyes shot to the opposite bed, standing empty, and he rolled out onto his feet. He had the horrible feeling that the world had passed him by, that he had missed something critical while he slept. He stared at his wrist. The watch was definitely gone. Then, with a curse, he crossed the room and ripped open Blackie's footlocker. Sure enough, the watch lay with the heap of gold jewelry on the dirty clothes pile. He stared at it as he restrapped it on his wrist. Then he walked into the lavatory, splashed cold water into his face, and tried to quell the fierce, painful throbbing in his head. The watch said eight-thirty. He had slept for five hours, five precise hours for Conroe to hide, cover his tracks, disappear deeper into this mire of human trash. Jeff stumbled to the door, glanced out to see two gray-clothed guards passing in the corridor. Quietly he pulled the door shut. His stomach was screaming from hunger and he searched the room restlessly. Finally he unearthed a box of crackers and a quarter pound of cheese in the bottom of Blackie's locker. He ate ravenously and drank some water from the lavatory tap. Then he sank down on the edge of the bed. The dream again, the same horrible, frightening, desperate dream, the dream that recurred and recurred, always different, yet always the same the same face that had haunted him all his life, the face that had almost driven him insane that day, five years before, when he met it face to face for the first time, the face of the man he had hunted to the ends of the earth. But never had he caught the man, never had he seen him but for brief glimpses. Conroe had slipped from every trap before it was sprung. Yet finally he had become so desperate that he was forced to retreat down a one-way road that led to hellish death. Jeff shook his head hopelessly as he tried to piece together the situation. He was in a half-world of avaricious men and women out to sell themselves for incredible fees. It was a half-world that seemed to Jeff only slightly more insane than the warped, intense world of pressure and fear and insecurity that lay outside the Hoffman Center. And in this half-world were a doctor who knew Jeff was a fraud, a kleptomaniac girl who thought he was an addict, and somewhere the slender figure of the man he hunted. Again he walked to the door. After peering out cautiously, he started down the corridor. From the far end he heard a burst of laughter, the sound of many voices. The smell of coffee floated down the corridor to tantalize him. He followed the sounds and reached the large, long room that served as a lounge and library for the mercy men in his unit. The room was crowded. A dozen groups were huddled on the floor in a buzz of frantic excitement. The room was blue with cigarette smoke, and the lights glowed harshly from the walls. He saw the dice rolling in the centers of the groups, and he also saw half a dozen tables, crowded with bright-eyed people. He heard the riffle of playing cards and the harsh, tense laugh of a winner drawing in a pot. And then he spied the nasty Frenchman, his eyes bright with excitement a cup of exceedingly black coffee in one hand and a pile of white paper tags in the other. He grinned at Jeff with undisguised malice and said, "'Come on in, wise guy. Things are just beginning to get hot.' Blinking, Jeff walked into the room. End of chapter 4by Alan E. Norse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 His first impulse was to turn and run. There was no explaining it, no rationalizing the feeling of dread and danger that struck him as he walked into the room. The feeling swept over him with almost overpowering intensity. Something was unbearably wrong here. Jeff walked in slowly, closing the door behind him. The door seemed to be pulled tight shut, sucked out of his hand. That was when the tension in the air struck Jeff like an almost physical force, and his mind filled with dread. No one noticed him. He stared around himself curiously. He watched the nasty Frenchman shoulder his way through the crowd. One of Silly Giggin's particularly maddening nervous jazz arrangements was squawking from a player somewhere in the room and the air itself was filled with a jagged rattle of conversation that rose above the music. 
Most of the faces were new to Jeff. There were tired old ones, marked indelibly with lines of fear, lines of hunted hopelessness. There were faces with tight, compressed, bloodless lips. Faces with eyes full of coldness and cynicism, and faces radiating sharp, perverted intelligence. Crowds leaned tensely around the tables and watched the cards with eager, calculating eyes. Side bets were made as the hands were opened. Other groups huddled on the floor and watched the dice with beady, avaricious eyes. The music jangled and scraped, and little bursts of harsh laughter broke out to compete with it. And through it all ran the chilling, inescapable feeling of error, of something missed, something gone horribly wrong. He moved slowly through the room and searched the faces milling around him. His eyes caught Blackie's far across the room for the barest instant, and the chill of something gone wrong intensified and sent a quiver up his spine. He stopped a passerby and motioned at the nearest dice huddle. How do you get in? he asked. The man shrugged, looking at him strangely. You lay down your money and you play, he snapped. If you got no money, then you've got the next job's payoff to bet with. Smatter, Jack, you new around here? And the man moved on, shaking his head. Jeff nodded, realization striking. What would be more natural to a group of people teetering from day to day on the brink of death? The need for excitement, for activity, would be overpowering in a dismal prison place like this. And with the huge sums of money yet unearned to bet with, Jeff shuddered. Cutthroat games, yes but could they really explain this strange tension he sensed? Or had something happened, something to change the atmosphere, to pervade every nook and cranny of the room with an air of explosive tension? Jeff started moving toward the nasty Frenchman. The little man was gulping coffee in the corner. He sucked on a long, black cigar and appeared to be in deep conversation with a bald-headed giant who leaned against the wall. Jeff spotted Blackie again. She was across the room on her knees. She faced a little buck-toothed man as she swiftly rolled the three colored dice. Her eyes followed them, quick and unnaturally bright. Jeff shook his head. Pen Mumjohn was a high-speed, high-tension game, a game for the steel-nerved. Its famous deadlocks had often led to murder as the pots rose higher and higher. The girl seemed to be winning. She rolled the dice with trance-like regularity and the little buck-toothed man's face darkened as his money pile dwindled. Across the room a corner crap game was moving swiftly, with staggering sums of money passing from hand to hand. The card games, though slower, left a mark of their tension on the players' faces. Jeff still stared until he had seen every face in the room. Paul Conroe's face was not one of them. No, he had not expected that. But what had happened? It was maddening to stand there, to feel the tension in the room, sense that it was growing until it seemed to pound at his temples. No one else seemed to notice it. Was he the only one aware of the change in the air, in the sounds, even in the color of the light against the walls? Something was impelling him, urging him to run, to get away, to leave the room now while he could. Yet when he tried to analyze the creeping, poisonous fear, tried to pin it down, it wriggled away into the fringes of his mind and mocked him. Finally he reached the corner of the room. His ear caught the nasty Frenchman's nasal voice, and he froze as he stared at the little man. "'I tell you, Arpo, I hear it with my own ears. You never saw Shim so excited. And then Shaggy Parsons was saying that the whole unit was being split up. That's the A unit. I saw him, and when I was going through this afternoon. He was all excited, too. But why split it up? The huge, bald-headed man called Harpo growled, his heavy lips twisting in disgust. I don't trust Shaggy Parsons for nothing, and I think you hear what you want to hear. What's the point to it? Schimmel's coming along fine in the work he's using us in. The nasty Frenchman turned red. That's just it. We've been in and we're going to be out, right out in the cold. Can't you get that straight? Something's going to break. They're on to something, Schimmel and his boys, something big. And they've got a new man, somebody they're excited about, 
somebody that's been knocking walls down just by looking at them or something. Harpo made a disgusted noise. You mean the old ESP story again. So maybe they go off on another spook hunt. They'll get over it, same as they did the last time, or the time before. The nasty Frenchman's voice was tense. But they're changing things, and changes mean trouble. He glanced at Jeff, and his eyebrows went up. Look, they get on a line of work. They assign men to different parts of a job. They get work lined up months in advance. Then, all of a sudden, something new comes along. They get excited about something, and they toss out a couple dozen workers, add on a couple dozen new ones, change the fees, change the work, and they end up handing the best pay to somebody who's just come in. I don't like it. I've been in this place too long. I've had too many tough, lousy jobs here just to get pushed aside because they don't happen to be interested any more in what they were doing to me before, and they never tell us. We never know for sure. We just have to wait and guess and hope." The little man's eyes blazed. "'But we can pick up some things, a little here, a little there. You learn how, after a while. And I can tell you, something's wrong, something's going to happen. You can even feel it in here.' Jeff's skin crawled. That was it, of course. There was something wrong. But it hadn't happened yet. It was going to happen. He stared at a huddled group around a Pan Moom John game, watched the bright colored dice cubes roll across and back, across and back. A newcomer, the nasty Frenchman had said, someone who had come in and disrupted the smooth work schedule of the center, someone who had the doctor suddenly excited, someone whom they were planning to use on a spook hunt. What kind of a spook hunt? Why that choice of words? Could Conroe conceivably be the newcomer they had been talking about? It didn't seem possible that it could have happened so suddenly if Conroe were the one. But who? And what did this have to do with the ever-growing sense of impending danger that pervaded the room right now? Jeff's eyes wandered to the dice game, and the fear in his mind suddenly grew to a screaming torrent. Go away, Jeff. Don't watch. Don't look. He scowled, suddenly angry. Why not look? What was there so dangerous in a dice game? He moved over to the nearby huddle and watched the moving cubes in fascination. No, Jeff, no, don't do it, Jeff. With a curse, he dropped to his knees and reached out for the dice. You in? somebody asked. Jeff nodded, his face like a rock. The voice had stopped screaming in his ear, and now something else grew in his mind a wild exhilaration that caught his breath and swept through his brain like a whirlwind. His eyes sparkled, and he pulled money from his pocket. He laid the bills on the floor, and his hands closed on the dice. He faced a little, pimple-faced man with beady black eyes, and he raised the three brightly colored dice, rolling into the familiar pattern. The dice deadlocked in four throws. He sweated out seven more with new dice. Then Jeff saw a break in the odds boosted the ante on his next throw, and caught his breath as the man facing him matched it. The dice rolled, fell into deadlock again, and the crowd around them gasped, moving in closer around them. The third set of dice was brought out for the attempts at deadlock breaking. Then a fourth set followed, as the complex structure of the game built up like a house of cards. Then Jeff's dice at last rolled a critical number, and the structure began to break apart throw after throw falling faster and faster into his hands. Four or five people moved in at his side, with side bets, and began to collect along with him, as he moved into another game, built it up. This one he lost cold, but still he played on, his excitement growing. And then, suddenly, pandemonium broke loose in the room. Eyes glanced up, startled, at the two men, far across the room, who stood facing each other, eyes blazing. Throw them down. Go on. Throw them. See how they land." Somebody shouted, "'What happened, Archie?' "'He's got loaded dice in here somehow.' Archie pointed an accusing finger at the other man. "'They don't fall right. There's something wrong with them.' The other man snarled. "'So you aren't winning any more. So what?' 
You brought the dice in yourself. But the odds aren't right. There's something funny going on." Jeff turned back to the dice, his mind still screaming, sensing that disaster hung in the air like a heavy sword. His own game moved on, faster and faster. Somewhere across the room another fight broke out, and another. Several men dropped out of games and stood up against the walls. Their eyes were wide with anger as they watched the other players. And then Jeff rolled three sixes, fourteen times in a row. He tossed the dice down in front of his gaping opponents with a curse and walked shakily back to the corner. The whole room spun around his head. Suddenly, in this room, probabilities have gone mad. He could feel the shifting instability of the atmosphere, as real and oppressive to him as if it were solid and he were attempting to wade through it. This was what had been bothering him, plaguing him. Quite suddenly, and without explanation, something impossible had begun to happen. Cards had begun to fall in unbelievable sequences, repeating themselves with idiotic regularity. Dice had defied the laws of gravity as they spun on the tables and floor. A hubbub filled the room as the players stopped and stared at each other, unable to comprehend the impossible that was happening before their eyes. And then Blackie was passing Jeff, her face flushed, a curious light of desperation in her eyes. An impulse passed through Jeff's mind. He reached out an arm, stopped the girl. Game, he said sharply. Her eyes flashed at him. What game? Anything. He held up his wrist before her eyes and showed her the gold watch. We can play for this. Something flared in her eyes for a moment before she gained control. Then she was down on her knees, pushing her sleeves up, a tight look of fear and dread haunting her eyes as she looked up at Jeff. Something's happening, she said softly. The dice, they're not right. I know it. Why not? His voice was hoarse, his eyes hard on her face. She threw him a baffled look. There isn't any reason. Nothing is different. But the dice don't fall right. That's all. They just don't. Jeff grinned tightly. Go on. Throw them. She threw the dice, saw them dance on the floor, caught her number. Jeff rolled them, beat her on it, picked up the money. He rolled again, then again. The tightness grew around the girl's eyes, little tense lines hardened near her mouth. Nervously, she fumbled a cigarette into her mouth, lit it, puffed as the dice rolled. She lost. She lost again. Side bets picked up around them, the people as they watched, catching the tension that was building up. What's happening? The dice. My God, they've gone crazy. Blackie's losing. What do you think? Losing? She never loses on dice. Who's the guy? Never saw him before. Look, he took another one. Those dice are hexed. My cards were crazy, too. King high, full, every time. A dozen hands in a row. How can you bet on something like that, I ask you? The silly Giggins record screeched louder, then gave a squawk as the record suddenly shattered in a thousand pieces. Somebody cursed and threw a pack of cards on the floor and a scream broke out across the room. One group came suddenly to blows. Several dice games tightened down to bloody conflict between individuals. A man burst into tears, suddenly, and sat back on his haunches, his face stricken. "'They can't act this way!' he wailed. "'They just can't!' Jeff's eyes watched the spinning dice, and again something was screaming in his ear. He felt as though his head were going to burst, but he continued to roll and he saw the girl's face darken with each throw. He saw the fear shine out from her blue eyes. Suddenly she let out a curse, snatched the dice from Jeff's hand and threw them sharply across the room. She stared at Jeff venomously, then glared at the people around her as if she were a cornered animal. "'It's all of you,' she snarled. "'You're turning them against me. You're making them fall wrong.' She spat on the floor and started for the door. Jeff moved after her but felt a restraining hand on his arm. "'Leave her alone,' said the nasty Frenchman. "'You'll have trouble on your hands if you don't. You'll see what I meant about something being wrong. The whole crowd here is on edge, as if somebody were picking them up and throwing them down. 
Who ever saw dice fall that way, or cards fall that way? The little man's eyes flashed slyly. Unless somebody was controlling them. Jeff's breath was faster as he stared at the nasty Frenchman, and his voice was hoarse. What are you talking about? The little man's lips twisted angrily. You saw what happened in here, didn't you? Jeff turned away in anger. He wove through the crowd, his jaw tight as he moved toward the door. The nasty Frenchman could only glimpse the truth, but someone else saw more, much more. Somehow Jeff knew that this past hour held the key to the whole problem, if he could only see it. Here was the answer to the whole tangled puzzle of the girl and Paul Conroe, of Dr. Schimmel and the Mercy Men. And he knew that when he reached the room the girl would be waiting. She would be waiting with cold fire in her eyes, as she sat at the table, a small pair of colored dice lying before her in the dim light. Jeff hurried down the darkened corridor, fear exploding in his brain. She would be there, and he knew why she would be smoldering when he walked into the room. He had seen her eyes, seen her face as they had thrown the dice. He knew beyond any shadow of doubt who had been controlling the dice. The girl was waiting, just as he had known she would. He stepped into the room and closed the door gently behind him, facing her desperate eyes as she rolled the colored dice back and forth in front of her. Game, she challenged, her voice harsh and metallic. The room was tense with silent fear as he sank down opposite her at the table. End of chapter 5